Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Sulan Mussing, and I'm host of the podcast Taste of Place, part of the Whetstone Radio Collective. This podcast investigates our relationship with nostalgia, the past, and our place in the world through taste. And we're starting with pepper. I speak with scientists, academics, chefs, farmers, a perfumer, and many more to bring the tangible and theoretical together. So tune in and subscribe to Taste of Place on your favorite podcast app now. They're as fresh as the breeze. Eggs come to you fresh every day. Serve them any way you please. Eggs are natural and economical, so keep enough on hand. Nature made them nice and neat. High in protein and only 80 calories each. Eggs are a natural wonder for meals, snacks, appetizers, whatever. All you do is heat and eat. Eggs don't run out. The incredible edible egg. In the past decade, demand for eggs has grown, with each person in this country eating about 286 eggs per year. But the kind of eggs we're looking for has changed during that time, too. And in response to those hopes and dreams we all have for where those eggs come from and how those hens lived out their lives, egg cartons and the labels and claims on them are working overtime to tell us a story. On today's episode, we look at the many labels on your carton of eggs and dig into what they mean and what they definitely don't mean. I'm Jerusha Klemperer, and this is What You're Eating, a project of foodprint.org. We aim to help you understand how your food gets to your plate and see the full impact of the food system on animals, planet, and people. We uncover the problems with the industrial food system and offer examples of more sustainable practices, as well as practical advice for how you can help support a better system through the food that you buy and the system changes you push for. If you want to dive in to the gnarly... <laughs> Wild West of food label claims, a great place to start it is the egg case. So it's not that big. How much could be going on there? But I think it's really kind of a good snapshot of the types of claims that companies use. I'm pretty limited space. It's actually astonishing if you pick up a carton of eggs. There's not a lot of white space. They have found a way to fill it with words. That was Patty Lavera, who's worked for a long time on different food and agricultural policy issues, especially around how food animals are raised. The food print team decided to follow her assignment. So we headed to a bunch of different grocery stores to see what we could find in the egg aisle. It'd be great to do like a round robin where people just kind of share their own personal experience. I went to the local co-op. I wrote down um, vegetarian feed, local farm fresh eggs from free ranging hens, also pasture raised, no GMOs, no antibiotics, and 12 grade A extra large eggs. I think even beyond the just like organic or cage-free or pasture-raised or whatever it might be, even just like the labels of like jumbo, extra jumbo, large, double A, like what does that even mean? I mean, there's all this other stuff that you have to take into consideration before you even get into the like, how was this? chicken raised and how were these eggs produced not to mention also the brown and white egg thing right just like a well, bunch of them are brown and a bunch are white and what the hell does that mean i went to my little smaller supermarket and in this pretty small case they had jammed in so many different brands so many different types and certifications and whatever it was a dizzying array of options it was wild it was funny to me that like you know natural is the biggest word on the package by far. Um, I saw a lot of natural. Fresh air, free to forage. That's on Organic Valley's packaging. Another package I saw had hand packed as being a, a call out item, which all of a sudden made me question how all the other eggs are getting <laughs> into the containers. <laughs> Anyone ever seen this label before? Eco meal? No. Mm -mm. no. This Trader Joe's pasture raised one specifies that vegetarian feed, but nothing about GMO. I do think, like, in spite of the fact that you can um, find, like, eggs that have, like, with plus or minus any of the certifications in any combination, they are often kind of relying on the fact that people are mentally bundling some of these characteristics. I mean, for me, most, most times it's local or, like, our, our CSA. Uh, we get our eggs. But if I do go to the store and I need to get eggs from the store, I'm usually looking for organic 
and usually pasture raise as much as possible. Um, and as many, you know, if there are any certified claims, then I look for those. But for the most part, buy most of our eggs from just our local local farm stand or from our CSA is usually where we get ours from. I'll say that I was surprised that a lot of the organic and cage-free ones came in plastic packaging, which was just a note that I was, yeah, just taken aback by. I think I'm scanning just to make sure like it's the right size first. Um, having accidentally bought the wrong size of egg once or twice before. Um, and then after that, I think I, I'm at minimum looking for cage-free, uh, usually cage-free organic, but I will admit if there's a huge price point difference between the organic and the not, um, I don't always go for it. Um, but I'm looking at packaging and preferentially picking cardboard nine times out of 10. Oh yeah, cardboard. I have a box that says from the happy hens at West Wind Farms, is that? the same oh, place? Oh, no, sorry. It was Happy Egg Company. Oh, okay. So I have some other happy hens that are somewhere else. I Just to let you know. <laughs> happy hens. There are other locations. Hens are from <laughs> Rhinebeck, New York. Happy hens. Okay. Here. Yeah. Oh, and Vital Farms has the, the phrase happy hens on theirs. They have lots of these like lovely handwritten phrases on their eggs. Happy hens is not a regular way to claim. This must be the big question on consumers' minds. How happy were the hens who laid these eggs for me? Certainly, egg producers are trying very hard to assuage our fears. So what is life like for a typical hen? If we're going to understand what any of these labels mean and get a baseline for hen happiness, we need to dig into how eggs are typically produced. As one might imagine, industrial egg production is a very intensive operation. You can picture thousands, even tens of thousands of birds sort of all crammed together. I'm Urvashi Rangan. I'm the chief scientist at the Grace Communications Foundation. Often cages are used. That's a slightly different production practice than what we typically see in broiler production, for example. Broilers are typically not caged, actually. So when you see cage-free, it doesn't mean a whole lot on a broiler. On the other hand, on a chicken, it would mean something different because a lot of egg-laying hens can be caged. And I believe the space requirement for a chicken by the United Egg Producers is about 8.5 by 11 inches. So it's like a sheet of paper is the size allotment for a chicken. So you get an idea of they're just sort of very cramped conditions almost on top of each other. Maybe you'd even be stacking cages on top of each other. Even without cages, it's a very confined and dirty operation. We tend to manage this with feeding antibiotics on a daily basis, just like we do with poultry production or other meat production. And of course, these animals are living so closely that when they get diseases, they spread very quickly. And then typically in flocks, you need to treat the whole flock for disease. You can't just treat one animal simply because it just spreads so quickly. So those are some of the highlights. I would say a little bit on the animal welfare side of things. We talked a little bit in the poultry podcast about the cannibalistic nature of chickens. When they're too close together, they will start to peck at one another, and that leads to other disease problems for them and illnesses. And same thing, of course, in eggs. So debeaking and things like that can be common. Physical alterations one might make, which really makes it hard for the animals to live a natural life to any degree. Industrial egg production really does beg a lot of questions in terms of the animal's health and hygiene, the ultimate human health and hygiene of the system, the subsequent antibiotic resistance that's sent out into the environment from the farms, the poor animal welfare practices, um, and not to mention even workers who then work with poultry or in the slaughterhouses or in the egg houses are also prone to higher risks of exposure when we're dealing with sort of dirty operation. You go to the egg section of the grocery store, you know, and it's not that big, but you could count a dozen different claims probably across those cartons. But the one that really I think has risen to the top just in terms of like people are aware of it, big companies making claims about it is probably cage free. So we're free. Yep, totally cage free. Totally cage free. Oh, I'm so excited. You know, we could do anything. Anything. We could fly. No, we can't. Well, we could run. Yeah, run. Oh, I love running. Or just talk. I like to talk. We could, talk. We could make eggs. Yeah, eggs. Or maybe we could cross the road. You did not just say that. 
Today, Denny's is making a commitment by 2026 to get their eggs from cage-free chickens. What they do with their freedom is completely up to them. Like any food label, the best advice I can give is to be as literal <laughs> as possible and don't don't give any one label claim too much credit. So cage-free is a great example of that. It means what it literally says, there aren't cages. It does not mean that the chickens are outside all day, are in this luxurious, like super low density, you know, they have as much room as they want, like fantastically natural environment. It just means there's not cages. Having said that, the cages are rough. And if anybody's seen these pictures, that's something to not have. They call them battery cages because they would be like a battery of them on the walls. I mean, really extreme confinement is what you're talking about. So is that an improvement not to have the cages? Yeah, of course it is. But don't assume past that, that that automatically means this is Farmer Bob with three chickens outside and each one has a name, you know, and, and that's what it means. It means they're in a building probably without those, those really extreme confinement battery cages. I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but I think most people are disappointed when they learn what cage-free actually means. My name's Emily Moose, and I'm the executive director of A Greener World. We're a nonprofit third-party certification program. Our goal and kind of the reason for our existence is to connect farmers and consumers around transparency and sustainability in food labels. There is no independent third-party verification of this term, usually, and there's no legal regulated definition for laying hens. It, it, it usually signifies systems where the birds are raised inside large barns or warehouses, and it doesn't address whether or not they have access to the outdoors. If there was access to the outdoors, if it was actually pasture or if it was concrete or a dirt lot, it doesn't address things like beak trimming. And all that is not to say give up on food labels. Obviously, we definitely believe in the power of food labels and they're important and they have a really important role to play in the food system. I think the lesson here is really make sure you're asking for what you want and do your research before you demand a claim that's out of step with your expectation. Okay. Is that an improvement at all over the cages at least? You will find arguments on both sides of that. Some will say that there is an increased risk of cannibalism in those systems, and it really depends on the system. It's definitely a lower welfare potential than a outdoor high welfare pasture-based system. So if people are thinking this label means the chicken had a better life and they're picturing grass, let's say, that's where that disconnect is really going to be. Yes. When you see it cage free, you know, that's fine. The, just like no antibiotics, maybe the animals were out of their cages and they weren't stacked in cages. Is that something? It's something. But at the end of the day, being crammed on the floor of a house with thousands of other birds standing in your excrement is also not a good situation that still leads to many of the same problems. Maybe they're just not as confined, but they could be because they really try to cram those houses with as many birds as possible. Cage-free eggs, we see them pretty much everywhere today. They're fairly easy to find, but that wasn't the case 10 years ago, and even five years ago, they kind of were niche. My name is Ryan Nebaker, and I am the research and policy analyst for Foodprint. The demand for cage-free eggs has really appeared within the last 10 to 20 years, and that's largely a product of California. When California, the largest, most populous state in the country, passes laws about things, the rest of the country that supplies California with things kind of has no choice but to supply things for that market, and they sort of move the needle all at once. And this was definitely the case with cage-free eggs. So back in 2008, California voters approved Prop 2, which was supposed to, and that's a critical word here, supposed to ban cages for laying hens. The proponents of the bill very much believed it would do that. The voters very much believed it would do that. And the egg industry believed it would do that. And once the law went into effect, predictably, industry was pretty upset. They put up the usual 
complaints that they do when this kind of legislation passes, that it'll be too expensive and that producers don't have the resources to comply, especially without federal aid. So they took it to court. And the thing that they took it to court on was that the law was too vague about like what you were actually supposed to supply the chickens with. The Ninth Circuit actually ended up siding with the law rather than the egg industry on this one. But then the industry kind of turned around and said, wait a minute, the law is too vague. Let's work with that. So functionally, it actually didn't end up banning cages for laying hens. It just, they got around it by giving them more space inside of cages. It's still not a lot of cage space at all. But recognizing that the market was going to probably move in that direction anyway, a lot of producers took Prop 2 as a signal that cage-free was going to become something that consumers increasingly demanded, and that legislation around it could likely become more specific if similar propositions were to pass in other states. So at this point, there are a significant percentage of eggs produced in the country that are cage-free in a way that we would actually recognize as being cage-free, in addition to the sort of dubious, it's not a fully restrictive cage that Prop 2 enabled. On the whole, the fact that cage-free eggs have become so much more popular than they were in the past does just point to this idea that there's been a mindset shift around how we think about this. And from an advocacy standpoint, picking kind of cage-free as a very simple phrase to understand sticks in your head. You intuitively know what that means, even if there's a little bit of a letter of the law versus the spirit of the law thing going on. It was a very specific kind of thing to aim for, and so advocates were quite smart in the way that they made that a target. So as of last year, which is the most recent data I can find in 2021, cage-free production accounted for 29% of all of the egg-laying chickens. That's up from 28% in 2020, 14% in 2016, and only 4% in 2010. So to go from 4% to 29% in the space of 11 years is a pretty astronomical shift. There have been a couple different ways that something like cage-free really became widespread, had, had a lot of awareness. And so different groups have campaigned on this over the years. And in some, there's kind of parallel tracks of, of trying to change what the standard of the industry practice is. This makes sense, right? They looked at the supply chain and said, who's buying a lot of eggs? Like, yes, as consumers, you know, we all go buy a dozen eggs every X off, not everybody, but you know, lots of households go buy a dozen eggs periodically. But also there's a lot of eggs in the food system you don't see. You either eat them away from home if you, and you know it's an egg because it's in an egg sandwich, but there's eggs in baked goods. There's eggs in mayonnaise. You know, there's lots of eggs being used when you don't think of it being in there. And so they looked at the supply chain and started to pressure, you know, big restaurant chains, big processed food companies to switch, right? And to say the eggs in our products or the eggs in our restaurants, you know, will be cage free. By 2015, a few major companies, including McDonald's, Starbucks, and Costco, announced that they would be requiring all of their suppliers to go cage-free. And this had major market impacts. This was the result of a kind of parallel activist track to the one that was pushing for legal changes like Prop 2. These pushes were successful in changing corporate supply chains, propelling state laws about production practices, and also in persuading the hearts and minds of consumers. If we were to have like a, a battery hen cam, you know, it was like, let's put a GoPro on the hen. And let's look at the life of one of these hens. No one would want to eat eggs. You'd only have a few people in the world who'd be like, oh yeah, I want to support this. This is amazing. Like these hens suffered to give me food. These hens bled for my breakfast. These hens pecked their eyeballs out and cannibalized each other so I can have cheap eggs. My name is Errol Schweitzer. I've been in the food business since 1994. Off and on, I've worked in food service, retail, farmers markets, organic farms, landscaping, warehouse, and retail. I worked at Whole Foods for 14 years, including seven years as the vice president of grocery, where I was responsible for a $5 billion business unit, the grocery department. For the most part, people don't want other things to suffer for them to eat, or they don't want to believe that they are making other things 
suffer. I think there's been clear customer trends. Like every few months, another survey comes out that consumers want to eat healthier, more sustainable, more ethically produced products. It's it's growing, you know, plant-based, animal-free categories, and it's growing, you know, whatever you call it, organic, regenerative, ethical, humane, and these these trends get more and more stark as the consumer cohorts get younger. Cage-free has become a kind of floor, the base minimum that a lot of consumers expect. Another label that's pretty ubiquitous at this point is USDA certified organic. For the moment, USDA organic does not mean that those hens were happily hanging out outside on grass. Patty Lavera has worked on organic rules for many years now, and she explained a bit about the ongoing process for updating what's called the Organic Livestock and Poultry Rule. In the fall of 2022, if you go to the store and you see certified organic eggs that have that USDA green and white seal on there, there's some things you do know. You know what they ate. They ate organic feed. You know they weren't given antibiotics. You know they weren't given other synthetic, you know, hormones or things like that, although there's not a lot of hormone use in any egg production. But so there's some baseline things that you know. Some things that need to be tightened up is about the buildings and the density and whether that what is happening right now meets kind of those core principles of the folks who started organic agriculture, what what, we originally went into the law in 1990 that created the USDA organic label. So that law says that animals need to be able to express their natural behaviors, and it says that animals need to have access to the outdoors. And that's a real contentious point in organic today is whether everybody's living up to those standards. So there are some big organic operations It's not, if you looked at the number of organic farms that raise some eggs, most of the number of those farms are meeting those standards, but there's a a smaller number of really big operations. And a lot of folks say they're not meeting those standards. So the birds are indoors all the time or too much of the time and, you know, that they don't have essentially meaningful access to the outside. And so right now, after many fits and starts and attempts and, you know, rules getting written and then rules getting written at the very end of the Obama administration and then not getting finished and then they got withdrawn by the Trump administration, there have been lawsuits. I Just the drama of these organic standards around egg-laying birds is serious. Right now, there is a proposed rule out there from the USDA. So there's more steps. We're going to do a public comment period. They got to write a final rule. But there's a rule out there saying a couple of things. The porches don't count for outdoor access. And trying, I'm not going to go through all of the, the numbers and the math, but trying to say there is a density you can't exceed in terms of, you know, each bird needs this much space. There's lots of folks who are doing a good job and are doing what most consumers expect, but because it isn't crystal clear, no wiggle room for interpretation, there are some certifiers that are letting these big operations do things that I think don't meet consumer expectations. So we're long overdue to tighten those standards up and take away any wiggle room, any room for differing interpretation so consumers can really understand what is happening in organic. When the food print team went looking at supermarket eggs, none of us found any cartons that said free range. But this is something that has been put on egg cartons for years now. Though it sounds like it might be going out of favor. If you do see free range on a carton, what does it mean, if anything? Free range is not a regulated term when it comes to eggs. USDA does regulate free range for poultry more broadly, and that just requires that there's outdoor access for chickens. But again, that's not for eggs. And outdoor access is pretty vague. That can mean anything from genuine access to an outdoor space with plants and sunshine, and it can also just mean a porch. But when we see free range or pasture raised on an egg label, if it's not attached to a third party that's verifying that, then that's just kind of up in the air, right? And they're relying on kind of you as the consumer to do some vibe-based associations on what you think that means and how happy the chickens are, right? It's mainly a marketing tool. I suspect that free range has mostly been abandoned for the trendier, happier sounding pasture raised. Pasture raised shows up on a lot of egg cartons. And while it doesn't have an official definition, it's generally used to mean something more than organics access to outdoors. And it's supposed to indicate that each hen has more than 108 square feet to move around. I asked Emily Moose if this definitely means that they were outside 
on grass. In absence of a credible third-party certification, I really wouldn't expect that they were. I wouldn't assume that they were. I'll put it that way. And this is not to say that everybody lies on their labels. That's not true. Obviously, some people are truthful and just not certified. But when you're in the store and you're looking at a carton of eggs, obviously that company has a big enough budget to get their eggs that far. They probably have a big enough budget to get certified, especially with one as affordable as ours. So I think that when when you're looking at claims that imply a lot, it's good to look for verification as well. And pasture raised is one of those claims that just sounds so great. And it's also really easy to make without being verified. I'm sure you're familiar with the term greenwashing that I think that is one of the most commonly used greenwashing phrases to imply that animals are raised outdoors in a pasture-based system when they may not be. And it may be that that proverbial door at the end of the warehouse where they may or may not go outside. I don't think most people would, would call that a truly pasture-based system. So when you see the animal welfare approved logo on a carton of eggs, you know that the hens were raised in a high welfare pasture-based system. You know that they were had the freedom to run around and scratch and peck and had a species-appropriate diet, clean water, that there were no routine antibiotics given. You also know that they were raised to some of the highest welfare standards out there. When it comes to eggs, one of the most common certifications you can find at the supermarket outside of organic is certified humane. So what does it tell us? What can we assume when we see that certified humane label? As the name implies, it's mainly about animal welfare. So there are minimum space requirements. There is outdoor access that is required. But critically, that's only if they're making claims about there being access or free range, right? So there's kind of levels within Certified Humane and they will give you sub-certifications. So if you are Certified Humane and your packaging says that you are free range, then they are verifying that your chickens do have outdoor space and that they have a significant amount of it, right? But when it comes to animal welfare, what we really care about is the idea that these animals can engage in natural behaviors. And when we look at a system like battery cages, where hens are just parked in a little shoebox, cannot do things like walk around. They cannot kind of sit on perches of various heights. They can't interact. Birds do things like dust bathing, where they kind of get their feathers all clean by rolling around in the dust, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but it works for them. So Certified Humane does require, even without outdoor access, they require housing that allows birds to engage in those natural behaviors. And so the big ones are the hens need to be uncaged, they need to be able to perch, they need to have access to things like nest boxes and dust bathing. So when we look at kind of the natural behavior of laying hens, they need to be able to engage in all those things. They also limit flock density, which means that you are not cramming as many chickens in as you can. So Certified Humane assures that some basic and important animal welfare provisions are met. And when it's paired with words like free range and pasture raised, it actually certifies that they are what they say on that front too, which makes it a pretty useful certification. Another phrase that shows up on egg cartons a lot is vegetarian fed. And it's clear that egg producers are trying to convey something important with it, but what? Why should we care if chickens were vegetarians? Chickens in nature love to scratch the dirt. They preen themselves in dirt. They like to roll around in it. And what does that do? Like, there's all sorts of microorganisms in the dirt. It turns out they need essential amino acids, chickens. They're not actually vegetarian. They're omnivores. And a lot of industrial poultry and egg production will feed synthetic amino acids to chickens. But actually, insects are the way chickens get those amino acids naturally. It's how their bodies want to absorb them naturally. So nature gives to them some essential amino acids, for example. They take those and they'll eat larvae and other things like that from insects. And again, this is how nature sort of intended for it all to happen. That is what 
a chicken's gut wants a chicken actually doesn't naturally eat corn that which is what we feed so much of our chicken and that's not what their gut biome wants it's not the best for their gut health and it actually can be problematic for pathogen contamination as well because their guts end up being a different pH even than they should be because they're eating food that nature, again, didn't intend for them to eat. So why did vegetarian fed become something that companies felt was important to say? My theory is that it spun off of mad cow disease when people were like, cows are eating cows? What other animals are eating things? In theory, a chicken that went outside on a pasture might eat some bugs. So I don't know what that tells you, except that that chicken ate what most factory farms chicken ate which is probably corn um but okay fine it was vegetarian fed How worried should we be about salmonella in our eggs? Salmonella, frankly, is a problem throughout the poultry system. It's in the feed, it's at the farms, it's in the slaughterhouses. We do not take the steps that we actually need to do to get to the origin of the problem. And we, in our sort of management from a regulatory perspective, often start at the end of the line. So we're looking at the end of the line and what are the washes you can dunk the meat in at the end when they're dirty and clean them up? What can you wash the egg with? Rather than asking the questions of, well, how do I make this system cleaner to begin with? I actually, for listeners, spent about 17 years at Consumer Reports, and I led food safety and sustainability investigations. Among those were testing national sample sizes of chicken and beef and turkey and shrimp and a variety of different foods looking specifically at pathogen contamination, filth contamination, proxies for filth contamination and drug resistance of those organisms to various antibiotics so we could take a look at some of the how risky was it all and there's a couple of things to note in all of it one is that salmonella is one of these very prominent promoters of foodborne illness There's over a million infections every year that are salmonella and food related. About 26,000 hospitalizations and over 400 deaths a year from salmonella and food. So that's not nothing. And and then when you sort of look at the food breakdown of it, it's actually kind of interesting. Eggs actually make up about 18% of salmonella illness cases a year. Poultry meat, on the other hand, makes up about 30%. So it is true that eggs are a carrier for salmonella. But when you look at what else carries salmonella, there are a lot of other things too. Pork, beef, even incidents on fruit and nuts. And we can talk about why salmonella gets to those points. Because ultimately, it's a gut pathogen. It lives in the gut. And when the gut is nicked or there are bad hygiene conditions or bad manure management, that's when you start to see this type of contamination. In the slaughterhouses, you might nick the gut and get contamination that way on meat. On eggs, there are two ways salmonella might get into the egg. It can get into the egg itself, although they say that cases of that have actually gone down over the years. I think there were measures taken that started to reduce the incidence of that. Primarily these days, it's about what's on the shell of the egg, and if you crack it, you might get that salmonella break into the egg itself. Generally, most commercial eggs are washed. That has reduced incidence even more. But really, when you want to look at the source of these issues and why they've become so prevalent in our industrial ag system, you kind of have to go back to the farm itself and look at what's being done or really what's not being done that is proliferating this problem. And when we look to better ways of production, there are better ways to do this in which you can manage the levels of filth and contamination and thus these types of pathogenic risks that that come from it. In terms of those better ways of production, like pasture-raised, they're more and more available at a lot of grocery chains. 
and I wanted to learn a bit more about these companies to understand if the higher price points and the good vibes from their packaging and their brands are worth investing in as a customer. The majority of eggs 15 years ago were conventional factory farm produced mass market eggs. And so that means the hens are grown in cages with usually less than a square foot of space each. They were fed a conventional feed brought to you by your tax dollars, you know, genetically modified soy and corn, heavily grown through government subsidies on large monoculture uh, farms, usually in the Midwest. And so there was a small section of eggs that was organic, you know, organic standards 15 years ago. And then there were some local farms around the country, small, you know, to medium scale growers who had direct sales relationships with customers. They were selling into farmers markets, like all over the East Coast and West Coast. And they were using a new method, quote, new, everything old is new again, called pasture raising, where they gave the hens significant access to the outdoors. Now, it greatly affected the quality of the egg in terms of these hens were eating bugs. They were, they were eating grass clippings and grass. I mean, they were, they were mowing the lawn, these hens, and it made the yolks like bright orange, high carotenoids, different omega fatty acid profile, and then really stronger taste, you know, more buttery, a little gamier. Essentially, when you would compare the look and the what we call, you know, in product development, organoleptic qualities of the egg, it was night and day, they're completely different. And eventually, a couple of entrepreneurs realized, oh, we could be selling these really cool eggs produced in this more humane, holistic way into grocery stores. But customers really started liking these types of eggs and they like the marketing. They like what the products were about and what they were saying. And so a couple retailers, larger retailers, because these, these smaller scale brands were able to sell into cooperatives and small natural and specialty and local stores. But when you get to the size of something like at the time, Whole Foods, you know, 15 years ago, having, you know, a couple hundred stores, you need some level of scale. And so they identified a few suppliers around the country who were producing eggs through this technique, getting, you know, humanely certified, you know, using, you know, legit pasture raised methods and, you know, negotiate with them on the type of scale and the quantities they could provide as well as what the price point was and eventually started seeing these eggs on shelf. This comes from the About Our Eggs page on the website of Vital Farms, one of the suppliers Errol was referring to. We began as a single family farm. As we grew, we didn't make our farm bigger. We found more like-minded farmers who put the welfare of their feathered friends first. Today, we partner with over 275 small family farms. Hansenbrook Farms, another big pasture-raised producer across the Northeast and Midwest, also works by overseeing and distributing eggs from a network of small producers. I asked Errol about these three brands that show up at a lot of grocery stores. And it's important to mention that when Errol was VP of Grocery at Whole Foods, he was an early champion of Vital Farms and partnered with them to bring them to market at scale. Hansenbrook is an organic pasture-raised brand that is based in a uh upstate New York in the Northeast that has to seasonally pasture the birds because as you Yankees know, it's tundra for three or four months of the year. It's not, not really great to be pasturing little chickens out there. Vital Farms is based across the South, from the Southeast to the Southwest. They, they try to stay below Mason-Dixon so that they can pasture and you know run their birds outdoors year round. Pete and Jerry is an organic brand, period. Hanson Brook is an organic pasture-raised brand, period. And there's nuances there. Vital Farms is a brand with multiple segments, multiple competitive segments. So they have an organic pasture-raised brand, which is as good or even better than Hanson Brook in some ways because they're able to pasture the birds year-round. Hanson Brook is only using organic feed. And then Pete and Jerry's is an organic certifi certified producer only using organic feed, but is not a pasture-raised operation. They are using cage-free large-scale barns with outdoor access and all the other benefits of organic certification. So in, in some ways, they're probably the most efficient producer. They're the most large-scale producer because of the amount of hens that any one of their operations can be housing and the amount of eggs that they, they can produce because they don't have the 108-square-foot outdoor space requirement for all their eggs. But let's say a person wanted to just avoid all this nonsense. Forget about having to decipher labels and just 
get some hens and produce really great eggs themselves. I've always been really interested in animal welfare as a subject. In a lot of the food writing I've done, that's a pretty common theme for something that I've written about. My name is Tova Danovich. I'm a freelance journalist and the author of the upcoming book, Under the Henfluence, Inside the World of Backyard Chickens and the People Who Love Them. I think typically we treat animals very poorly in the industrial farm system, and I kind of believe in if we are going to use them for food, there should be more of a transactional encounter where we take care of them and they take care of us. And I feel that we have broken our side of that bargain for the most part these days. So I was mostly interested in having backyard eggs because I knew that the chickens would be treated really well. Obviously you have the added bonus of kind of feeling like the eggs are better. I know there have been a lot of people that have tried to do A and B tests. Can you tell if a backyard egg is better or not? And Oftentimes they can't, but I think that animal welfare component is super important. I was living in New York and seemed to be getting backyard chickens between, you know, maybe 2005, 2015. They were really having a moment because everyone was doing the know your farmer, know your food, best way to know your food, have hens in the backyard. <laughs> you know exactly where eggs are coming from. So I was living in Brooklyn. And that is not an easy environment to raise chickens in. But my husband and I made plans to move to Portland, Oregon. And I knew immediately, top of my to-do list, gonna get chickens in Portland. It's going to be great. Um, so like everyone else, you know, we, we moved to Portland, got settled, and we got this flock of chickens, um, mostly for, for eggs at first. I knew I liked them enough to be willing to take care of them. But mostly I just thought, you know, they're they're going to lay some eggs. Eventually they're going to slow down their laying and then probably I'll have to take them somewhere to be retired because they're just egg producers. And that's something you do have to think about when you're making the decision to get chickens in your backyard. But I just completely fell in love with them and now they've turned into pets. I currently have seven and they're all different sizes and breeds. They lay different egg colors, but a lot of them are honestly kind of useless for egg laying. They don't lay very regularly or they lay tiny eggs, but for two people, seven chickens still gets you way more eggs than you could ever possibly eat on your own. A funny thing about chickens that I really didn't know until I had them is that eggs are a seasonal product. So in the industrial you know, farming system, people use supplemental light in these barns that they keep chickens in all the time that puts them in kind of perpetual spring and summer. So their egg laying is tied to the amount of light that you get during the day. So if you don't have supplemental light, they lay a lot in spring, summer, and then fall, they start to taper off. In winter, they go on kind of a three month break from egg laying. So we let our chickens take the break because I think it's it's better for their overall health, which means starting about August, September, we start stockpiling all of our eggs. I bought a small mini fridge just for this purpose because it keeps the eggs longer. So we just have, you know, cartons with dates on them in, in this fridge ready to go and get us through the winter until they start laying again in spring. The eggs that most people are getting in the grocery store, I forget the exact amount, but they're going to be at least a month old by the time you get them. So they are collected from the hens. They have to be washed, which they don't make you do in other countries. In the US, they do. And because they're washed, we're washing off this protective layer called the bloom that makes it so they have to be refrigerated in order to stay good. And then these eggs are trucked all over the country and then they sit in the grocery store until someone is ready to buy them and then go home with you and sit in your fridge. So you're getting some old eggs by the time you get them, which they're fine to eat. They make a great hard boiled egg. Hard boiling fresh eggs takes, it's more difficult for chemical reasons I do not totally understand. So when you're getting eggs from your backyard, you're starting on day zero. We keep our eggs unwashed, which means we can store them on the counter, which is great when you sometimes are getting, you know, seven eggs a day from seven chickens. And that would take up a lot of fridge space if we had to refrigerate them. 
So they can last quite a while. I like to say about three months I feel good about, and we store them unwashed in the refrigerator. Maybe they would last longer, but they don't last that long in our household. So I've never found out. When I got chickens, I kind of had the the farmyard types in my head. So, you know, I knew there were white chickens. I knew there were black and white chickens. I knew there were red chickens. And I was like, great, I'll get one of each. Won't that be amazing? So you start going to websites or places where you can get chicks from and suddenly there are like 400 plus kinds of chickens to choose from. You have bantam varieties, which are going to be miniature chickens, and then you have the full-size ones. You have them in all kinds of different colors. You know, some of them are that classic chicken shape, but then you get ones that have almost like bell-bottom pants on their feet, or they have little poofs of feathers on their heads. And the world of chickens just gets bigger the more <laughs> you look into it. So my first chickens that I got were more on the side of these are going to be good egg producers. I got a chicken that was going to lay a blue egg, a dark green egg, and then just a normal, you know, brown egg laying hen. And I still love having rainbow eggs, especially if you, you're going to have a pile of eggs sitting on your counter. It's nice for them to all be different colors and sizes, and it really makes you feel like you have something different from what you're getting in the grocery store. But once I started adding to my flock after that, realizing these are now pets, they don't have to be remotely useful, I got just the silliest variety of chickens. I have two that are actually the same breed. They're a ducal bantam in two different colors. And they're so small, they fit in the palm of your hand and they have these giant, giant feet and little beards. I, I discovered I just love bearded chickens for whatever reason, that's what appeals to me. The way egg color works in hens is that they all start off white when they're first being formed and then colors get added almost like printer toner as they're traveling down the oviduct and out into the world. So when you have something like a green egg, I'm not great with egg genetics, but I believe it's actually a mix of brown and another color bred together chickens that have the genetics for those two. And that produces a chicken that raises green eggs. So if you get really into chicken breeding, you know all of that side of things. But the reason that we only have hens currently that lay white or brown in the grocery store is those are the breeds that produce 300 plus eggs per year. Now, the whole reason that you began your journey, if somewhat naively at the beginning, was, you know, a desire to get away from the factory farms system. Now, having raised chickens for this long, has it further entrenched any of your feelings, brought up new feelings? When talking eggs specifically, one really big thing that people are working on is in-egg sexing of chickens. Because when we're looking at the egg industry, the specialization of egg laying breeds and meat breeds is so different that egg laying hens, when they become too old to be useful in the industry, are worth so little money, they're just killed and landfilled a lot of the time because it costs more to process them than you'll actually get back for the meat. So if you're a male chick born in the egg industry, you are useless right away. And there are billions of these chicks that are killed every year. No one likes that that is happening. In Europe, they already have some preliminary systems of actually being able to sex chicks before they hatch and not allow the male chicks to further develop. It has not become scalable and cheap enough yet for the U.S. egg industry to want to take current technologies that we have and put them in place. But I know that's something that everyone is actually trying to make happen. And I think just that alone is going to make a really big difference. But there are certainly things like getting rid of battery cages for hens, which I think the cage free movement has done a lot to help further that will help. But a lot of it are incremental steps towards making things better for chickens, who I think are really the most mistreated animal of all the mistreated animals in industrial agriculture right now. They're the only ones that don't even count under the humane slaughter rules to have standards for how you dispose of them, which is not the case for 
pigs or cows or other animals. So I think that really speaks volumes to how little we think about the welfare of these animals. And is it because of some, like, because they're not furry? Or like, you know, like, what is that based on? I have to believe that it is this mammal bias we have, you know, I, I think it takes a lot more time with the chicken to have their personality come out. And they have a lot of personality <laughs> once once you let that happen. But you know, they don't have sad baby cow eyes and big eyelashes and their beak can't express any kind of emotion whatsoever. So it really takes that extra step to kind of come around to the fact that birds are just as thinking and feeling as interesting as all of the other animal species we have on the planet. The thing that people should be doing, if they have enough time to be thinking about this, is lobbying for better organic standards, like the implementation of the organic livestock and, and poultry rule to assure that there's better animal welfare standards for organic. But I think even more than that, you know, why is it only California that's passed this cage-free egg law? What about where other people live? You know, the fact that still the vast majority of eggs are produced in battery hen operations. So, so yeah, there is nuances between these these brands that make up you know less than five percent of, of the egg category. There's differences. There's definitely some compromises some of them have made relative to scaling. But I, you know, I think it's besides the point because eighty percent of the category in most stores and most areas of the country are still battery hen eggs. If you want to move the needle on eggs, you have to talk about policy. We we need to stop putting it on. The shoulders of consumers you know it just it makes me it just pisses me off that all these things boil down to individual consumer choice as if that is actually a source of freedom i actually find it to be deeply exploitative and oppressive because it deflects blame and responsibility from the large scale you know industries and actors that we really need to have greater you know scrutiny and control over we hunt for the eggs from the happiest hens learning about labels and scouring company websites for explanations of their production practices. We calculate the humanity of a square foot versus 108 square feet. We measure the externalized costs of air polluted with chicken litter. Maybe we even buy a few hens of our own. At this moment, it's what we have available to us to support a better system, to raise the floor of acceptable practices. We could always subsidize the good stuff, both in terms of subsidizing organic and regenerative feed, subsidizing producers more effectively and more extensively for, you know, tearing out barns and trying to do more pasture-raised eggs. I don't think we can only do pasture-raised eggs. I'd be very curious if we could ever produce enough eggs to meet demand in that. But we can definitely do a lot more and we probably are doing way too much of the battery hen eggs. And then finally, imagine if consumer subsidies covered organic food prices. Like what if, consumers were refunded the price difference between what they were paying for the battery hen eggs or the cage-free eggs and organic regenerative. Or if there was some, you know, food utility, public food access, a public option for food where food wasn't commodified as an individual price that, you know, folks essentially took out a food library card and said, well, I need these this many eggs for the week. I have two growing kids and I want to make a few omelets. And, you know, you get your food library card and you just take your couple cartons of eggs. I'm just saying, you know, call me an extremist, but maybe food should not have to always be priced and treated as a commodity. Maybe food should be a right. What You're Eating is produced by Nathan Dalton and Foodprint.org, which is a project of the Grace Communications Foundation. Special thanks to Patty Lavera, Urvashi Rangan, Emily Moose, Ryan Nebiger, Tova Danovich, and Errol Schweitzer. You can find us at www.foodprint.org, where we have this podcast as well as articles, reports, a food label guide, and more.